new job and it was all private rentals. I hated every second of it, but I was good at it. Every, every door I would knock on, they'd be like, you know what? I would really like to buy a house like this. And I was like, people are buying houses. People are buying houses. Oh my gosh. And it caught on like quick. I was like, I can still sell real estate again, but only in this niche because nobody else was buying houses. Everybody, like every neighborhood, half the streets were in foreclosure. Everybody was losing their cars, their homes, everything. It was a disaster. No real estate agents had business except these particular real estate agents that were working alongside these management companies in Kissimmee at the time, they were making a fortune in the worst economy ever. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Orlando Podcast. With me here today, my guest is Erica Muller. Erica, thanks for being here today. Hi, Tyler. Thanks for having me. It's very exciting to be on this chat with you. Yeah, we've known each other for a little bit now, so it's it's fun to do this together. But uh, we're going to go ahead and start off the same way we do with everybody. So, Erica, tell me, why do you do what you do? That's a really loaded question, but I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, I do what I do because, well, now it's too late to turn back, right? <laughs> I'm already so deep into it. It's like you had this client. Let's say you're working with this client who you've been, you've been spending a year showing them houses. And it's like you can't walk away because they're so close, right? Um, I originally got into doing what I do because I love making life easier for people. I love automations. I'm a total data nerd. And um, I always ran my real estate business in a very automated fashion. And I always tried to, tried to find easier ways to do things. So I wanted to bring that to the real estate community. And now I'm so deep into these projects that, you know, I love what I do, uh, but I'm certainly not walking away at this point because I'm very deep into it. So it's a combination of I have too much time and too much of my life committed to what I'm doing. And also just a general passion for making life easier um, for real estate agents and investors. That's really cool. Uh, what I didn't hear you tell us was what you actually do right now. So oh. what is it that you're currently building? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually building automations and data tools for real estate agents to better serve investor clients. And the way that the industry is going is that investors protect us in a down market. As real estate agents, we need them in our portfolio but they can be a little bit messy to work with sometimes if we don't have the right tools and we don't have the right background. So we're trying to be the easy button for real estate agents to come in and kind of be like, that was easy. Yep. By using our technology. So that's what I'm building right now. Our data technology tools for realtors to be able to share with their investors. That's really cool. Tell me a little bit about the data technology tool. How does it specifically help a real estate agent that might be working with investors? And is it all kinds of investors or is it a specific type of investor? Yeah, great question. So um, it's for the real estate agents right now that are working with the short term rental investors. But we know that all investors are potentially short term rental investors. Most of them want to add this to their that kind of investment to their portfolio. So agents, if they want to capture that business, if they're working with any investor, they need to be prepared with the right data tools to show them. What it means for the agent is a lot of the guesswork is taken out of them having to track down information, wait days or sometimes weeks to get it, um, having the assurance that they're not guessing about what's the right place for an investor to invest in. One, as, one thing as agents we don't want to do is guess when we try to give investors um, in advice, right? We want to come across as a well-educated and data-backed advisor. So we allow agents to plug in and do that. We also take a lot of the pro forma writing off the plate for the agents so their investors can self-serve. Um, so really, it's all about taking these mundane, everyday tasks that we have to do with investors, making them easy for the agent giving the investors the ability to self-serve because that's really what they want to do. They don't want to have to pick up the phone and call us every time they need to write a pro forma. They don't want to pick up the phone and call us every time they have a question about how much money a property can generate. They want to just have access to that on their own, but they, we also don't want them going off our platform to go get that information. Mm -hmm. We want to keep them in front of our technology that has our face, that has our brand on it. So that's what we do here is we white label this 
so that investors can better self-serve, so that agents have more time um, and can take back that time, allowing their investors to self-serve and focus on growing their sales funnel. That's really cool. How did you come up with this idea of building a data tool for agents to deliver yeah. to their clients and investors? Anything I built is because I first used it and needed it myself. So everything I've done, I've been working with short-term rental investors since 2007. So everything I've done and I've built has to have first been done manually or, or in analog fashion by me. And so me having to scale out working with investors, I had no problem generating leads. Like I can generate hundreds of investor leads. My problem as an agent was I couldn't service that many because of the amount of work that goes into trying to service those investors. So the very first need came about by figuring out how to automate pro forma processes for these investors. Um, and that was kind of our original pro forma tool. And then the whole data situation came up because the market was changing so fast that the, the, the strategies that I knew that were working two and three years ago, at least in my market when I was selling, no longer applied anymore. And I found that to be true across the board with short-term rentals is because prices were raising so fast um, and rental rates weren't raising in proportion. I was getting scared to give advice when investors would come to me and be like, which market should I invest in? I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to tell them because I really didn't know anymore. So I had to go back to the drawing board and figure out how can I solve this problem? How can I tell investors with full confidence which market to invest in and make sure that what I'm telling them is true and that it's updating every single month as the market shifts? So that's kind of how I got started is, you know, always a need first. And one of the things I realized was I would talk to 15 to 20 investors a week. They would call in to our company. And my role was to assess what their buying situation was, their cash flow goals, and then get them routed, routed to the right agent that could service them. But it was a big responsibility because mm -hmm. I had to make sure that the market I suggested them go to go buy in was the right market for them. So I realized that the only way I can actually do that was to find out, well, what kind of a cash on cash return do these people need? In other words, how much money do they really need to put in their pocket every year? And how much money do they have to get started, which is their down payment? And so I built a an analog pro forma where when I would talk to an investor, I would just ask them two questions. I'd be like, how much money do you need to make? What's your down payment amount? And I'd plug it into my pro forma and it would spit back to me a cash on cash return. And so that I had a list of like 20 markets at the time that I had really good short term rental agents in. And I did the analysis with the agents individually of like really what kind of cash flow was available in their market. So I could then intelligently pair that investor with those agents, but that was too much work, right? So it was still a lot of work. So then we just built technology to do it all. And then we're like, well, why, why are we just using it for us? Like, why don't we just take this to the agent community? Cause they're going to have the same problem scaling out with investors if they don't have access to better technology. So that's why we did what we did and why we took it to agents and not investors. Another reason we didn't take it to investors is because it's a bit too complicated for the everyday investor. We feel like agents should always be positioned as the experts. That's how I wanted to be positioned as an agent was the advisor, not the salesperson. Okay. So when an investor would call me, the best way to position myself as an advisor and not a salesperson was to make sure I had the right tools in front of me when I was talking to them. Um, so yeah, we just felt like agents had more of a need for this than investors because investors are still, you know, new to this. And a lot of them don't have enough knowledge to interpret what is a cap rate? What is a cash on cash return? They just don't know. Sure. That's really interesting. So what I find interesting is that you started selling short-term rentals in 2007. Airbnb didn't even exist. No, it was super weird back then. <laughs> it was so weird. Okay. So it was not, it was not easy. Um, it was actually very difficult because nobody in America knew what a short term rental was. All the right. real estate agents thought I was like a freak because they're like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I sell short term rentals to people from other countries that come here and they stay for vacation and they all go to Disney World. And they're like, that's so weird. I'm like, yeah, but it works. It's a thing. And nobody wanted to get involved with it because it was just such a niche, really niche thing. And it was only like overseas or international people buying here at the time. So Canada, the Canadians loved Florida. They were coming here, buying their condos. They, they loved their condos or their small cottages. Um, and then we had the UK crowd. 
they would come here. They loved it in um, certain neighborhoods here that the UK buyers loved it there. Then the Brazilian crowd started coming in, um, which caused me to start having to learn Portuguese so I could work with them. Um, so that was always fun. And I landed some really great clients from there, but still, I think it was like 2014, 2015, and still US buyers were really not catching on yet. So like for the first seven years or so of doing that, I, I was just working with international investors. And then finally, like one day, everything just popped in the US and people started catching on to Airbnb. And finally, I, it wasn't hard for me hard for me anymore to find agents in other markets to start sending referrals to and starting to you know find like other agents I could talk to about this. So it took a while to catch on. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's incredible. And I, I can't, um, it's hard for me to fathom how much change you've seen just here in the local Orlando Disney market as it pertains to short term rentals with the evolution of Airbnb and VRBO and, and now the amount of neighborhoods that are specifically designed for this purpose. So it's just fascinating to me. Why did you decide or how did you stumble upon selling short term rentals so long ago when nobody else was doing it? That's a really interesting question. And I'm going to be just very transparent about this. So the market was totally collapsing. This was the very beginning of the real yep. estate collapse. And I was a commercial real estate agent. I did commercial and I did um, residential investments. And overnight, I just woke up one day and all the business dried up. Okay. Like mm -hmm. all of it was gone. I had no business left. And I was living in South Florida. I had a, I had a newborn baby. I just bought a house. It was an expensive house at the time. You know, I was, it was about a half a million dollars and I was 23 or 24 years old. So it was a big mortgage at the time. Um, and I had bills to pay. So it was just scary, right? I was losing everything. I ended up losing that house. Um, and I ended up, and I was married to my ex-husband at the time who was in construction. And we kind of looked at each other and we're like, what are we going to do? Because his business was drying up also. So we didn't have savings because we were young and we were stupid and we didn't save money. Because, you know, when you're when you're 24, 25 years old, making 200 grand a year, you're spending more than you're making because you just don't learn those lessons quickly enough. So that was a hard lesson for me that I learned back then. Um, anyway, so we kind of looked at each other. We're like, what are we going to do? We, we got into some other alternative type of businesses like vending machines, things like that. And we bought this vending route that um, massage chairs that you would put in the malls and people would put cash in it and they would, you know, and we collect it every month. And that's like all we could figure out what to do while everything was imploding. And one of those routes, we had like two or three locations in Orlando that took us through Orlando. It was at, um, I think it was at the old outlets before they shut down. There was like Monkey Joe's was over there. We had them there and Fun Spot and a few other places. So we kept coming through Orlando to have to service these chairs on our way up to Georgia. And we were like noticing that the cost of living at the time was less expensive in Orlando um, and that there was still real estate happening here. It wasn't like collapsing as fast as it did in South Florida. So we just kind of said, look, you know, we have a better opportunity of making it here than we do down there. We need to get out of South Florida. We already losing our house. It was in foreclosure. So we just came up here. And we rented a house in Windermere, which ended up going into foreclosure. Um, but while we were here, I was looking for a job job, right? Because I had to go back to doing something. I couldn't just, you know, rely on our vending route. And so I found an ad where it was a short-term rental management company in Kissimmee. And they were looking for a owner liaison. I had no idea what that meant, but I was like, hey, I can do this, whatever it is. Um, and I applied. And they loved me and they hired me right away. And my job was to go to all of the houses where people were currently staying, the ones that were occupied with guests, knock on their door, totally unannounced. That's a horrible job to begin with. <laughs> knock on their door, totally unannounced while they're on vacation and say, hey, did you know you can buy the house that you're currently staying in? <laughs> and that was literally like one step above timeshare. So that was my new job and it was all private rentals. I hated every second of it, but I was good at it. Every, every door I would knock on, they'd be like, you know what? I would really like to buy a house like this. And I was like, people are buying houses. People are buying houses. Oh my gosh. And I caught on like quick. I was like, I can still sell real estate again, but only in this niche because nobody else was buying houses. Everybody, like every neighborhood 
half the streets were in foreclosure. Everybody was losing their cars, their homes, everything. It was a disaster. No real estate agents had business, except these particular real estate agents that were working alongside these management companies in Kissimmee at the time, they were making a fortune in the worst economy ever. So I was like, that's it. I'm getting back into real estate. Uh, I put on my real estate hat again. I'm, I'm done with knocking on doors, trying to get them to buy and sending them to these agents. I want to be the agent. So then I went to the group that hired me and I told them what I wanted to do. I wanted to move from this position to the real estate position and they fired me right on the spot. And they're like, get out right now, get out of the office. There's like, we're not doing this. And so I went to their competitor and I hung my real estate license with their competitor. And I started my company called the Flamingo Group, which took off. So that's how I got into short-term rentals. That's incredible. It was to, cool. Yeah, I think this, the story about knocking on doors is terrifying. I would also hate that. Um, it was horrible, but I'm so glad I did. It was the worst job ever, but... I mean, if I didn't do that, I would have never learned what a short-term rental was. And I would have never discovered all those international buyers that were just coming here with cash and buying all the real estate. I mean, it was like a huge gold mine at the time. And there was no agents to compete with. There was right. maybe like 10 agents in all of Kissimmee, Davenport, Claremont that were actually doing anything. So there was like hardly any competition. It was amazing. Hey. Before we go any further, if you're enjoying this content, please like and subscribe so you can help us get the word out about these amazing people and businesses here in the Orlando area. Don't miss out on upcoming episodes and help out the show. Now let's get back to it. That's incredible. Talk to me a little bit about the evolution because it sounds like you were selling a lot in the Kissimmee area and then you started to grow and build as your clientele of investors came in and they were looking for other places where they could allocate money. How did you start to build a network of short-term rental friendly agents across the country that you could start to build relationships with, understand their markets, and then funnel clients to them? Yeah, that came years, years later, because there it was not possible to do that for the first seven or eight years of short-term rentals, because there just wasn't any agents. And so what I tried to do was I built my course for agents, um, Certified Vacation Rental Agent. And I was like, well, if I can't find them, I'm going to go create them because I need to grow and scale this business. Um, so I created my course and I paired up with a marketing team to kind of get it out there. And, you know, just off my database, we sold like 30 of the certifications, but the marketing team totally flopped and didn't really do what they signed up to do. So we weren't able to really get it out there. Um, and during the time, well, they, you know, this was a total of like six months to a year this was happening. So during the time they were doing that in parallel, I was building a marketplace for short terminals, which was Rolio. Um, actually, no, this was a few years later, um, but I was in the beginning stages of mapping that out. So the course never did take off, but I ended up keeping it and using it for when I needed to go find a referral agent. I would send them this course and be like, look, just if you can take this course and learn, I'll teach you, I'll mentor you. I can start sending you leads to your market because you are in a good market. Like I would identify the market and then I would try to go find an agent that I could just turn into a short-term rental agent. And so it wasn't really until 2018, 2017, 2018, where there was enough of them out there to actually start scaling it out. Because I had a massive list of short-term rental investors. I mean, at the time, before I launched Rolio, I had about four or 5,000 investors in my database that would have bought in every market across the country, but not right. enough agents to send them to. So by the time I launched Rolio a couple years into it, you know, that list grew to like 18,000. Um, so as my list grew, more agents came on the market and it just naturally evolved together. Um, and we're now in the process of talking about, you know, how are we going to repurpose this course for agents that just want to get into this? I don't want to be in the course or coaching business, but you know, we're trying to figure out like, how can we best utilize it um, for agents that are still sitting out there that want to get into it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool. So aside from a total economy collapse, what are some of the other major struggles that you've run into as an entrepreneur, as you've gone from being full-time real estate sales and a group that sells and then getting into technology and teaching and coursing and building these other kind of ancillary businesses. Um, what have been some things that you've run into and, and how have you gone about trying to tackle them? 
Gosh, there's so many. Um, one of the biggest things Give me two. is, yeah, I'll pick two. One of them is build, building tech was expensive and I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. So I probably pissed away like 20 or $30,000 in mistakes before I actually figured out how to manage technology teams. It's not so easy to just hire a team and just hope they're gonna build something. Even the ones that have project managers, like 90% of the time, they're not able to deliver you what you expect if you're not actively involved in the project. So a huge challenge I had was making the decision to have to walk away from real estate full time. And I was doing really well to be a full time uh, founder of a tech company because I had to be in this project every single day. So that was hard. Fortunately, I had made some good choices after I got back on my feet after the collapse and I had invested in a lot of real estate. So I owned a pretty large portfolio at the time of mobile home parks that were bringing in a lot of net cash flow. <clears throat> so I was in the position that if I did walk away from selling real estate, I had this to fall back on so I can build something else. So the lesson there was always multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. Always, like you can't just rely on your real estate income because you might wanna do something different one day. You might wanna walk away and in parallel build something else with the skills you've learned. Um, so that was a big thing. And then also wasting money on tech. And I think the other big thing too, is that you have to make friends with everybody. You can't have enemies in this industry. Um, you know, the, the more people that you're friends with, the more people that like you and that you like them and you support each other, the further you'll go in the industry. So a lot of people are super competitive in nature and they're closed off and they don't want to share. They don't want to help their competitors. And I never really had that approach. I always looked at it like, I mean, I did in my early years because people would come work for me and then they would learn everything, steal my ideas and go compete against me. So that was hard as a local agent. That was really hard. Um, but as you grow on a bigger level, you can't afford to you know, squash people. You have to be friends with everybody and align yourself with those partnerships instead of worrying about who's competing against you because there's enough out there for everybody. That's that's so great. And uh, I, I don't know that I said this earlier, but this isn't specifically a real estate show. And so I talk to all kinds of business owners. And one of the things that I that I think holds true, uh, uh, both of the things that you said, I think are true for every business owner, regardless of whether they're in real estate or not. You have to have multiple streams of income. You can't yeah. just have one thing because what if your industry flops or stops or your product is discontinued or whatever that looks like, right? So having multiple streams of income, I think is huge for every entrepreneur, every business owner. And then that other part of just being cooperative, being yep. friendly, getting yeah. to know the other people in your circle. Part of the reason why I do this show is just so I can meet other business owners because we think different, we act different, um, and we can all learn something from each other. So. Really great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about what are you learning these days? What are you reading? What are you teaching yourself? Are you a big believer in growth and books and reading and seminars and investing in your own growth? Yeah. I was just pulling up my Audible because there's a lot of them here. I kind of like have a little ADD and I jump from book to book without finishing one first. And I do it at night, you know, kind of when I'm before I'm going to bed, but a really good one right now. And yeah, huge believer in growth. You can never stop growing, never stop learning. You should always have something in front of you that you're learning. Um, one, I'm. it's not a book, but it's a course I'm currently doing. I'm trying to learn more about residential assisted living investments in real estate. So I am doing a course because I do believe that um, it's a very untapped niche in real estate on the investment side. And there's a lot of guaranteed money there. Um, so I am learning about that niche in real estate right now. So that's a course I'm taking on the weekends. Um, and then I'm reading a book, which I actually read it a long time ago, but I'm rereading it. It's called Ask by, I hope I don't butcher his name, Ryan Levesque. And it's a really great book because he teaches you not to assume that you know what people want and to just put something out there is the more you ask your consumer or client what it is they want, the more surveys you put out, the more like survey-based marketing you do, the better your funnels will become and the more targeted your, your product is to the right people. So that's a really great one I'm reading right now. And then building a story brand is another one because I'm really bad at storytelling. I'm a data person and I'm just straight to the point. And I kind of sometimes forget that that's not how other people 
respond to things. And most people respond to a great story. And so this book that I'm reading teaches you how to make everything so interesting that anybody will pay attention and listen. What I really like about it though, and the big lesson I'm getting from it is that um, it teaches us to really narrow down to what is most important to the actual person listening to your story. What do they care about? And I feel like a lot of real estate agents miss the mark on this one. A lot of real estate agents think that our clients care about how many houses we've sold, that we just made it into the president's club circle. They care about our production. Nobody except for other real estate agents really care about that. And so I'm really learning about like the client cares about, will you answer your phone Friday afternoon when I call you and it's you know important? Um, are you going to go out to that house for me if it comes up on a Sunday and I got to get an offer in like trying to really figure out and nail down? Like, are you are you hitting the right message to your clients? Because it's so important. Otherwise, we waste time and marketing dollars um, putting messages out there that are going to fall on deaf ears. Hey, before we go any further, if you're enjoying this content, please like and subscribe so you can help us get the word out about these amazing people and businesses here in the Orlando area. Don't miss out on upcoming episodes and help out the show. Now let's get back to it. Who's the author of the story brand book? Yeah, I knew that, that you were going to ask. That. Let me pull it up right now. It's Donald Miller. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you read it? No, but I've seen his ads on Facebook. He targets me. Yeah. Oh, so, well, there uh, you go. Are you interested in his ads? Do, they, do you find them? <laughs> I'm not doing listening to any yet. My okay. first exposure to Donald Miller was in a totally different, uh, was in a totally different, Thing. It was like in a marriage. Uh, oh, cool. Thing about improving marriages. Oh, um, that's great too. I didn't I, know he did that. That some friends of ours and I uh, and my wife and I were going through together as a group of people. That's great. You can never stop growing, even yeah. in your relationships. So, oh, yeah. Uh, well, that's really cool. So story brand and ask. I love that. I love that survey base and that, that, that I that idea about asking what your consumer really wants, yeah. not just assuming what they want based off of a limited interaction, but continue to dig deep uh, so that you can try to service them. Yeah. Really and cool. I, it's not as easy as it sounds too. Cause you know, yeah. you've really got to put effort into trying to figure it out. And, um, but you do learn over time. What are, what are some piece of pieces of advice that you would give to an aspiring entrepreneur, real estate space or not real estate space? They're thinking, I want to go start a business or I want to go work for myself. Mm -hmm. What's something that you would tell them that everybody needs to be thinking about as they, as they get ready to launch into something new like that? Yeah. Well, I'll start with the piece of advice I just gave my daughter because she's almost 18 and she wants to launch a clothing brand. And she's like, I hate business, but I'm really good at designing shirts and I'm going to start a t-shirt company. And I just said to her, the first book you need to read is The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. I read that. I was probably her age when I read it. Um, and I was like, what it teaches you, and this is for every entrepreneur, is like that there's more to business than just the part of it that you like. Um, and this is for every business because I actually tried getting into photography for a while because I loved it so much. And when I turned it into a business, it destroyed my love for it. So I wanted to like, so I went back to just being a hobbyist. Um, and so the big thing is, is just because you're good at something and just because you enjoy something doesn't necessarily mean that you should or you should turn it into a business or that it will make a good business because the other side to it is the business part. Um, however, maybe, it, maybe you will succeed at that, um, but you have to be willing to learn a lot about, you know, systems, automations, hiring people, scaling, marketing, um, read books and learn about the business side of things. Um, because I was a young entrepreneur, you know, I got my real estate license when I was 18 and I was really good at selling, but it took me at least five years to figure out how to actually manage and scale and deal, you know, and grow and like automate and do all those things. And so for me, I felt, I finally found in my early twenties that, you know, mid to early twenties, the automation was key to actually running a business. And without it, like, don't bother because you're just gonna end up giving yourself a job. And if you're just gonna have a job working for yourself, at the end of the day, it's actually more cushy to have a nice job working for someone else, getting a good salary where you don't take those problems home with you on the nights and the weekends. Because when you own a business, you go to sleep thinking about your problems, you wake up thinking about your company's problems, you take it into your weekends, you take it on your vacations, 
when you have a regular job, you clock in and out and it's not your problem. So really think hard about if you want to be married to this company or if you just want to date it because they're two different things. That's great advice. And I resonate with so much of those statements. I figured you would. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for me, I don't like taking orders from other people. So yeah. working for somebody else has has just become a non-option any longer. Now that I've had the taste of controlling mm. my calendar, uh, even though it feels like it controls me. Yeah, it um, does. <laughs> I, still, I still couldn't go back, right? Uh, so yeah. <laughs> very good. Um, what are you working on right now and where should people go to learn more about it? Yeah, so we're just continuing to work on our data solutions for agents to help them better serve investors and drive more investor leads. If they want to learn more, um, Tyler, I actually believe you have a link that you can post here um, that they'll be able to click on and they can go find out more. So just if you want to click on that link that Tyler shares and it'll take you to our trial site where you can sign up for a trial and demo this. We're going to do a live demo and get you set up with a trial. And I'm going to personally teach you on Wednesdays how to become an expert in using data. Uh, with your clients. And it's it's really just for agents that want to go to the next level in their sales game. We know it's not going to be every agent, which is why the ones that do choose this route are going to be so unique in their markets. Because leveling up, investing in education, learning a new skill takes time. And a lot of real estate agents aren't interested in doing that. So if you're yeah. one of those agents that is interested in investing in yourself, your business and learning new skills, this is a really cool thing to check out. And I will, I will plug uh, as somebody that works with investors, which is how you and I connected yeah. uh, that working with investors is one of the best things that a real estate agent can do because they do become uh, kind of the backbone of your business. Investors don't buy one property. They usually buy one a year. Yep. Right. And so uh, if you, you know, imagine you've got 20 people that buy one property every year, that'll put you on kind of cruise control in a real estate business. So uh, really yeah. great that you're helping agents identify how they can do that and then giving them the tools um, and the support in order to be able to actually go out and help that consumer. And there's a big demand for it. I've noticed uh, there's a lot of agents, you know, here in the U S and a lot of agents that don't understand the investing side of things. And so when you do learn that you can really differentiate yourself against all the other competition in your marketplace. Um, not that there's a lot of competition, right? There's enough business for everybody. We've all learned that. Yeah, so, there is, but, but we it does make wanna... you special. So yeah, we, we always want to have a skill that sets us apart, whether yeah. we have other we have competition or not. Like, what is unique to about you? You know, when the client picks up the phone, if they've talked to five other agents, why are you the one that they right. should you know engage with? So it really does help with that. And Tyler, you're very impressive too as an agent. We've seen how you're approaching. Um, you know, your clients in the market, you're in the same market I used to be in. So you know the struggles and how important it is to really have that data and differentiate yourself. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, hey, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, any final piece of advice for the listeners? Um, you know, just I just want to say whatever it is you're thinking about going to do, go do it. Go do it. If you're if you're young, especially like if you're under the age of 40 and you can take risks, just take the risk and go do it while you're young. Because um, I see a lot of people, you know, especially my parents that, you know, they're in their 60s now and they're older and they really wish they took more risks when they were younger because there comes a certain age where you feel like it's not safe anymore to try new things. So do it while you can. There's so many opportunities out there that everything you ever need to know, you can find on YouTube or ChatGPT. So there's really no excuse um, except for you just don't believe in yourself or you're not ready. And if you're not ready, it's okay. But you've got to take the risk at some point or you're just going to be talking about it 10 years from now. Awesome. Great piece of advice. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Well, hey, everybody, thanks for coming and uh, joining me for the show today. We'll see you around Central Florida. Bye. Bye.